I'm, um, I'll introduce myself again for those of you who could make the first uh, lecture. I'm really honoured to introduce myself, that's me, Tim Long, and also to announce the beginning of the lecture. So I'm doing everything at the moment myself. So um, let's make a start. First of all, the Centre for Practice-Based Research in the Arts I mentioned earlier, this is the website, so do have a look at it. There's some really interesting performance lectures that have been recorded. And so it's an archive of the work that was, uh, well, the lectures that were presented last year. And it's, it's now being built on. It's a significant uh, body of work. Uh, really interesting. So, um, first of all, um, to define terms, significant nonsense is an oxymoron. Nonsense isn't significant. But the Dada artist worked a se working a century ago used nonsense as a creative strategy to try to make sense of a world that seemed confusing, violent and challenging. I don't think things have changed very much and I'm certainly trying to make sense of a world that at times seems confusing and nonsensical and violent too. But that's about as much of a link I'm going to make with Dada for the time being. But I need to define too what uh, a manta is, and does anybody want to volunteer a definition? It's rather unfortunate word actually that I made a mistake over its meaning. Uh, but basically, minga and manta are the same thing. That is an unpleasant smell, a stink, to look or smell unpleasant, minga, an unattractive or undesirable personal thing. Minging, having an unpleasant smell, stinking, dirty, or unpleasant. So um, that's the month bit out of the way. Also, what is Bazooka Joe? Bazooka Joe, who can volunteer what Bazooka Joe is? Yes, Andy. It's bubblegum. <laughs> bubblegum. Is anybody going to give another meaning? Was there not an American cartoon character called Bazooka Joe? There was a cartoon, and I believe it was based on the bubblegum character. So, um, there's another meaning as well, which I'm going to investigate. Um, Bazooka Joe bubblegum, when I was a child, it was actually at, just at the right moment when I really loved sweets and bubblegum. And I wasn't actually allowed to eat bubblegum, so it was, had an extra sort of edge to it. Um, so, it was called Bazooka Joe, I don't know if it's, it's still around. But also, there was a band, a sort of uh, pub rock band, uh, called Bazooka Joe, which I saw when I was a teenager. And you probably recognise that man there on the right. <coughs> I think there's one of the singers from the man there at the bottom. Anyway, they, were, they, they split up and formed another band. So, what is a performance lecture? Isn't any lecture or reading a performance of sorts? In some contexts and settings, the form of the lecture, which means, after all, reading, is set out with rules and structure, and this lecture is not going to be very different. Except I'm not sure about the timing and the order of the slides, and the reading of my work is, and its meaning is open for discussion, as it's not really fixed. So I'm going to have to improvise a bit when I'm actually discussing my own work. So the intention of the lecture, after all that, is to explore the processes I engage with as an artist and the themes and ideas I'm interested in and highlight some sources and references that I find important and to really speculate on the meaning of my current activities but also what, I, what I'd like to do in the future. Um, my hope is by sharing these ideas and processes you can gain an insight into what I do and why I do it 
and I will as well. So I want to look forward to further developments and I'll point out where the, the, those might be going at the moment. First of all, I've got a few pieces of work here, one which is uh, at the back there. There's two prints associated with the head there at the back. Do have a look at it after the talk. Now, the two prints are actually made from the faces of the um, split head. So if you, if you actually unbolt two halves of the head, you'll find there are two wood blocks which have actually been used to, I printed them by hand, to make the prints. And they're, they're going into the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition, so it's going to be quite a, a raw sort of um, contribution to that this year. So I've covered that. Uh, also, I think the I think I'm an artist, and I think I'm a lecturer. So this sort of these are roles I've assumed rather than actually been sort of gifted to me. So I think it's quite a, quite um, important to say I'm speculating too about these things as as, as my in my status. But I'd like to point to a first influence, which is this idea of a talisman or a charm. And James touched on magic, and that's something I'm really interested in. But it's not that I believe in magic, but I like to believe in it as a possibility that objects have a particular property to human beings. And I'm interested in investigating the possibilities that objects have to help me understand my situation, my reality, which after all is a reality that uh, we share to some degree. So there's, there's a sort of social activity going on in that process too. One thing that's quite important is hybridity, where a robot and a pig will merge in the piece of my work, and I'll show you an example of that later. Also, the notion of the image in its fundamental religious sense is quite interesting to me. This is, this is sort of source material that I refer to, that I always go back to. Uh, the idea of an icon, a fetish, or an idol, that's important. But also depiction. The act of depicting something, especially in a work of art, so it's pictorialising, actually bringing into an object, drawing um, something which is represented. And what, what is it that I'm representing or seeking to represent? That's what I'm very curious about and that's what I want to try to pinpoint uh, today. So the talisman or the idea of a presence invested or discovered in an object. There's a force there. So in Roman art especially they use little curses which they scraped onto they scrapped onto bits of metal and chucked down wells. If somebody stole in your sword you could write a little curse saying, I hope they explode or whatever you like and then chuck it down a well and make that happen or not. So those are those are little um, curses there and out of these are sort of important images for people and obviously that's a sort of curse um, like a voodoo doll. So the process I um, use for making things is actually quite aggressive. It's cutting, hacking, you know, um, really moving quite stubborn material around. And I really enjoy that. I think the material properties are particularly important in relation to the way that the ideas evolve um, over time so that I can invest quite a lot of different qualities into a piece of work because they take so long and I have to spend time making decisions over uh, the changes in the next steps. So um, I've made some a set of works which I call the op optical works that involve lenses or actually highlight the process of looking or reference the process of looking. And this is called contradiction. It's I've, I've called it contradiction because normally when you see hollow eyes, you, you might think of a skull, there's something recessive about it. But because I've put lenses in it, for me anyway, it sort of contradicts that notion of there being nothing to see. 
because the sort of lenses that are, that are seen even though they're hollow. So it's important to have the right tools and this was um, a very practical decision for me to make to buy an old school vice and to attach it to a horse and so if I've got a very heavy piece of wood then I'll actually put weights below it to sort of tether it down so that nothing can move around. That's quite important. So also what's relevant too is that quite often I'll make a piece of work which has got kind of lugs on it so that I can clamp it into the vice. So there's partly a formal decision being made, but partly a practical decision. But occasionally I'll actually cut those lugs off, or I'll leave them. So with this piece, you can actually see that there's a face here at the back, which I, can, I actually did the eyes the other day, and you can actually put the uh, workpiece or head back into the vice and clamp it really easily there and start Packing it back. So this wooden, this wooden stuff, you know, it's, it's really important to emphasise that I'm. I've got these lumps of stuff I'm using. You know, see, it is very physical um, activity. So just to return to the idea of the talisman. Um, The potential for an object to represent human qualities, to encapsulate personal and social attributes. I've already touched on that. Um, I'm interested in objects that captivate in the way that captivate me um, in the way that a refrain or, or a song or a spoken phrase might do that. There's something which is compelling and seductive about it, or even invokes curiosity or conjures up questions. The, 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 if an object asks questions, asks me questions, I wonder how's that been made? Um, what is it trying to say? Then a dialogue starts up because absurdly the, the object is starting a conversation by saying, Look at me, I'm asking you a question because you don't understand what I mean. And actually, with the urinal, it's a good example where uh, people will say, well, that's not art. But of course, that's a really interesting question. What is art? And I think Duchamp was very good at being cheeky about getting people to think about what art was or what it is. And that question is still with us. But I'm interested in the process of interrogating an interior monologue of the self, where fears prosper. And what objects can animate a conversation between the interior self and the world that is shared between individuals? So I'm going to read that again, actually. I'm interested in the process of interrogating the interior monologue of the self, where fears prosper. What objects can animate a conversation between the interior self and the world that is shared between individuals. As an example of an interior monologue, having a voice is Macbeth's speech after he discovers his wife has died. And this actually came up from a question that I was asked by my friend and colleague, Goran, who's here today, fortunately. What kind of object would represent the nihilistic vision that Macbeth articulates um, when he has such a dark, horrid vision of the world. Let's have a look at the actual clip. Slaughterous thoughts cannot once start me. Wherefore was that cry? The Queen, my lord, is dead. She should have died hereafter. 
There would have been a time for such a word. shouldn't be hearing what he's saying because he's articulating something which is from deep within a core, an anxiety in his own being and I find that really interesting and I think that the this is my interpretation of my own object, I think that my objects are actually protecting that moment of dread or nihilism that he, that Macbeth is externalising and um, so that interior status is something that needs to be protected at the same time paradoxically um, articulated and externalised. Um, so I'm going to look at some source material which, which I find valuable personally that um, uh, animates this idea of, of a passage between an interior and an exterior place. So of course the, 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 the in particular, you know, I just mentioned, I haven't got any examples here, but the um, intercessor in Egyptian mortuary culture was a demigod whose task was to guide the souls of the death into the afterlife. And the intercessor was a guardian of a closed or blind door found in the Valley of the Kings, through which the living could not pass, but the dead could be guided. So the um, figures attendant to the doorway would be the ones who were waiting to take the um, soul of the, of the departed through to the afterlife and that they had a duty of guarding the door but also of um, being guardians of the, that sort of fragile um, soul that is passing from one state to the next. In Roman art too, the funerary portrait holds a special place and the portraits of the dead act as a memorial that arguably prolongs in memory those who are represented. So this is an example of a, of a, of a Roman mortuary um, stone. So the formal setting for the portraits are of particular interest to me because the rectangular stella acts as a shrine, a setting. So this, this is really the, for, the formal aspect of the way that the framing is important. And if, um, the, the, I'll touch on that in a moment too, but this rectangular location and the triangle and the inscription and so on is, is particularly important because if you had just the figure on its own, it wouldn't be doing the same thing. It's very much to do with the placement of the figure in a particular location. So doorways and passageways and movements between one place and another are particularly important. So I've actually blended together here, the sort of partly the theme of the um, Hamlet clip, which is warfare 
it's sort of supposedly set in some sort of communist era um, atrocity going on. Um, the, the, the doorways to bunkers and so on are actually rather similar to the architecture of the crypt and the, where relics would be kept or where rituals, special rituals, would be um, undertaken. So let me just go back now to this piece of work, which is dated from 2012. And it was in quite a lot of room in London. And um, I just found a piece of white blackout cloth and a piece of black blackout cloth. And I constructed a false door in the side of the gallery so that it was, it was important to me. I'm not sure how important it was to anyone else, but the fact that it was there was like a sort of opening or an offering to another place. But the actual piece of work was rather unpleasant because people were invited to hit the object on the, on the trolley there with the um, sticks. So it was a sort of anti-icon uh, ritual which people could partake in. And some, um, uh, I, was, I was quite surprised that some visitors ended up enjoying it a little bit too much. <laughs> <laughs> and I ended up hurting my arm as well, whacking it. So um, you can see that actually, if, if then if I was going to put on another show now, which would be which would be great if I did, I would I would use this um, kind of relationship between the object and the architectural space and the setting to um, conjure this, this sense of, of movement between one state and, and another. Um, so the position of the objects, this actually is, is the, the, the scene that I can see from um, my bed and these are little devotional things which I have near me um, and uh, they were exhibited here actually in, in a show, I think it was last year, alongside a sculpture which is sort of protected. So I'm going to make a jump now because in order to clarify what images are employed to represent the guardian of the realms of the self um, or aspects of subjectivity, what is being guarded and why. So what I'm <coughs> the jump is actually to go from Egyptian and Roman funerary art to think about my production and the way that I'm actually um, speculating that there's some sort of protective magic being um, um, animated through the objects I'm making. And I borrow these references, but I also borrow from other references that are like flavours of the culture and history I live through that has helped to shape who I am. So, a subjectivity infused by its time that is inevitably things that happen to me and cultural things that sort of seep through into me. They end up in the object. So if I you now quickly navigate through, try and find which direction it's gone in, here. This is actually a piece that I made and I, I made a baseball cap for him. And then I realised that it was Bazooka Joe, the bubblegum character. And, and uh, I hadn't had that in mind, but I, I sort of then made the jump back to my childhood and something sort of clicked. And so that's, that's quite important, but at the same time, I like this idea of the hybrid references sort of jumping back to ancient Rome and then jumping forward to the 1960s bubblegum. It's actually quite exciting. Uh, that these blends um, end up in, in the work. And it's sort of what I'm after, in, in a way, when a piece of work starts to um, have a discussion with me, that's when, instead of it just being lumps of wood, it ends up being something that I'm responsible for, almost like I'm responsible for some sort of person that I'm um, helping across the road, perhaps. Um, I'm not sure that's the right metaphor, but... <laughs> I want to get. I want them to be good um, in their own way. Um, so, or to sort of shine in their own potential. And actually, now I'm at, what I'm describing 
is a responsibility that I have for this inanimate object, this artificial um, thing, this object I've made. And I think it's quite important for there to be that attachment. Um, so uh, maybe I'll return to that. So distortion, exaggeration and displacement of the normal relationships of the human head and body. That's the sort of vocabulary that I'm worried about. And why am I doing that? Because actually then it seems to me the interior um, monologue that I'm describing starts to have a voice through the distortion. So if to represent a, a figure with the normal proportions would be representation, it would be a sort of objective representation. But I'm interested in a subjective representation of something that I'm not even sure about myself. So the distortion uh, which borrows from, um, I suppose, uh, modernist um, sources. Now I need to jump through to where I find those. Uh, yeah, the, whoops, um, Picasso, in, the 19, in 1927 anyway, he was making, this was between him doing all the sort of blue period classical stuff and going into uh, sort of more surrealist uh, work in the 30s, where he was using triangles, circles and motifs to represent the human uh, face in particular, and the human body. So he's, he's actually very playfully making these, uh, metaphors, so the, the, the eyelashes at the bottom there become a mouth, they seem to me to be a mouth, and then the eyelash at the top is, a, is an eye, but then also, if, I don't know if anybody thinks the nostrils are eyes. Please, could you make the nostrils eyes? <laughs> <laughs> because this is sort of terminology of the, of the, the human form, which is sort of made into a kind of a playful set of puns. And I think that there's a lot more to be taken from what Picasso is doing in this time. And it's sort of, it's almost like an unfinished business. So some of my work actually is sort of trying to um, uh, get, come to terms with my fascination with it. So this is actually another observation about my work that actually it's, a, it's also about art, it's about the, my interest in art that's already existed. So I suppose the, the reference to the, the Egyptian and, and the Roman material is it's almost like I'm sort of taking on a task which um, then somebody else will take on later. It's, it's, it's like art, is, it sort of generates itself and it has a, a momentum where uh, you're contributing to it, and you're taking part in a conversation, a discussion. <laughs> so I've mentioned that for the, for the moment anyway, my interpretation of my own work sees the object as a guard or protector, and it's protecting some sort of fearful or fragile sensation or anxiety. So it has a, um, a dual property, and this actually um, is um, the same as a, a herm might be at the edge of a piece of edge of a territory or something, where the uh, or or an object might actually be protecting, but because it has a grotesque or threatening form, it it also possesses the properties that it's seeking to repel. So it's already taken the threat into its own form and it's seeking to repel what it also represents. It's actually a bit of a puzzle to me. I don't know if I made that clear, but it's something very odd about that. So now I'm going to go through, um, go back. The process that I undergo for, for this piece of work anyway, I'll experiment with the configuration of the um, uh, pieces. So rather than working from solid um, blocks of wood, I've started to use this sort of compositional method where I'm actually gluing bits together and then um, inserting teeth and making eyes as separate components and then pushing them in. So there'll be a lot of, a lot of kind of changes and um, hesitant moves 
But of course, when you've got a solid material, you can't be too hesitant. Eventually, you have to make a cut. You have to say, that's actually where it's, the, it's going to change. And um, that's always an interesting moment because I think oh, I'm going to wreck what I've already got. But eventually, I have to make that decision. To t and in fact, the sort of destructive change that is undergone is usually productive, <coughs> even though there are quite a few lumps of wood that I've got. I'll show you that um, I'm really curious about because I don't quite understand how I've ended up with all of these random bits of wood. They're not all failed sculptures, and I put them on a table because I wanted to sit. I realised, well, they're not random bits of wood, they're actually a piece of work which is just made of fragments. So it's like a, a pile of rubbish on a table. I'm, I'm actually really curious about this sort of accumulation of stuff that I've got and what significance it might have. Five minutes, Tim. Okay. So now I'm going to go through sort of ra randomly actually going back um, and looking at other influences like paralopsy and sort of curious objects that I've found that I would actually home in on. So it's a, my sort of visual investigation is sort of an ongoing sort of curious thing that, that, that's, that's happening really. Um, and you can see the sort of exaggeration in Pelopsy's uh, blast there of the teeth and um, actually bringing an extreme texture to the um, surface of the figure as well. And his method of production with these was actually to cut lots of very intense use of the bandsaw, cut out lots and lots of lots of plaster and wood and then gluing them together in a sort of strap, it's like a strat stratified <coughs> method. And that's in opposition to the little Michelin man there which is sort of made of rings. So popular uh, sources like Punch and Judy, that's really important. So these are sort of little, little um, touchstones. I don't quite know what the, the term could be. These are little reference points for me. And also um, curious um, things in old trade catalogs. Which these are just masks that you could, you could buy. Um, so they end up being source material which I then adapt and develop. Um, this is a piece of work uh, which I've called the beginning and the end and it, it's actually a, sort of a response to the way that I've been using these um, fragments and instead of them being just scattered on the floor I've tied them together with uh, bits of string and then I made a sort of spine which you can't see which is underneath and then hung the, you can just see the top of it there, hung the um, bits of wood off it and um, it's actually a rather unpleasant piece of work, personally, I have to confess. And it's, um, I'd like to see it in a big space because I think it'll have some sort of power, a sort of presence, so that, that's what I'd like to have. But it's a little bit like some sort of bloodletting or um, a disaster that's happened in, 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 in sculptural form. Um, but I think it's quite important for, for me to identify that actually Patrick Stewart was speaking about his dread and fear and this nihilistic vision. I actually like that. It's, it's like, well, why am I attracted to that sort of dark vision and, and horror? Well, because it seems to have some sort of base, like there's a solid ground to it, which other ideas or other feelings might not have. So I think personally that's quite important. So I'd just like to touch on um, some source material. I've looked at other some openings like to you know architecture, semi-permanent architecture used in trench warfare. Um, Hitler's bunker, this this sense of a, a sort of architecture which is very much about closing things off and trapping things and or protecting them at the same time. And a reference point for me is so when I look at the newspaper on a weekend, I usually look at the news about films before I look at the news about contemporary art. 
So I think the, the films are a real sort of exciting source for me. And um, I think, I don't know what it says about me actually, but the <coughs> film Downfall, which I think was made in 2010 or something, I've watched it about three times. You know, it's actually fascinating in that uh, um, period. Um, and this is a very accurate rendering actually of the um, opening to um, Hitler's underground bunker in, in Berlin. So I'm trying to draw comparisons between these sort of uh, peculiar spaces. So let me just go back here. Yeah, also horror films like uh, Black Sunday in 1960, it actually opened with a horrible sequence where a mask that has got nails on it inside is actually attached to, um, forcefully, to a woman's um, head. It's a, it's a very, very unpleasant scene. Um, but it's, it's, it's still a good film, <laughs> probably because it's so horrible. So I think the horror, the horror films are another source of interest to me. Um, so I've also used, obviously used myself as a subject, so that might end up being a drawing or whatever, as where well. I'm actually sort of bringing some sort of interior status into um, a vision. Um, I'm quite frustrated as a, as a painter, but I do persist, and I've got more sort of canvases that are ready. Um, but actually, this sample um, shows that I'm still interested in some sort of um, uh, um, something that's slightly malignant, actually, about the way that I end up with these uh, painted images. Yeah, this, this, have, have I got much more time, James? One I'll, st yeah, I'll stop. Um, I'm actually going to, this is, I'll just cover two more pieces. This is another of the optical works that I was describing to you earlier. And it's, it's a two, um, well, t inverted tear-shaped head with eyes that you can only see when you actually view them in a mirror, which is set at 45 degrees. You can't actually see the objects themselves. Um, so I'm quite interested in the sort of puzzle of the way an object comes into um, being. So that's called um, siblings, and coming from a relatively large family, I get the feeling that um, even though I can see my brothers and sisters, I don't really know who they are. I'm, I'm sort of uh, it's just a, a sort of personal observation about uh, being a sibling. I don't know whether my children have the same feeling about that. But I'm not asking them any questions today. So, finally, this is a piece that I have in my office, and it's called uh, Pig Robot, and it's, um, it's, a, it's a pig robot. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, it, it, it encapsulates those, those two um, things. It's like this sort of an awkward combination between something like a sort of science fiction scenario of a, of a robot with an automated machine, which is fused in some sort of horrible scenario of genetic manipulation, you know, cyborg genetic manipulation into a new creature, which then ends up looking like this. So um, it has some similarity in, in the sense that I'm exaggerating the particular features, like the little forehead or the nostril, the nose, and so on. And then actually omitting other features, like there doesn't appear to be a mouth, it doesn't have a mouth. So um, that's it, really. The, um, I hope that I've given you some insight into what I think I'm up to, and I'd be really curious to hear what you think, and um, if you've got any questions, then I think you'd be happy to try and answer them.